Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our webinar today. Um, we're glad to have you here. We are the Florida Wildflower Foundation. Next slide. Just in case you're not familiar, familiar with our organization, the Florida Wildflower Foundation protects, connects, and expands native wildflower habitats through education, research, and planting and conservation programs statewide. You can find out more about Florida's wildflowers and about what we are doing at flawildflowers.org. Next slide. This presentation is brought to you by the State Wild Wildflower License Plate, and uh, we fund research, education, and planting projects through this plate. Whether you have the old look or the new one right here, you're helping to uh, spread wildflowers throughout the state. Next slide. So just a few housekeeping items before we start. Um, all attendees are gonna be muted with their cameras off for the duration of the webinar. This is being recorded and it will be available through youtube.com slash Florida FLA wildflowers and flawildflowers.org about 24 hours after this ends. So questions may be submitted via our Q&A feature at any point during the presentation um, please don't use it for chat, just questions um, that you have pertaining to the presentation. Uh, we will be answering them at the end of the presentation. And as time permits, uh, if your question is not answered, you may email it to us and we will send it to Nancy. And uh, you can email an info at flawildflowers.org. Next. So it's really my pleasure to uh, introduce you to Nancy Bissett. Nancy is, um, among other things, one of our board members, and um, she helped to put together our publication, 20 Easy to Grow Wildflowers. She is a horticulture, I'm sorry, a horticulturist, restoration ecologist, and botanist with the Natives, Inc., a Davenport, Florida firm that offers consulting, educational restoration, landscape architecture, and a native nursery. As the developer of the nursery, Nancy has experimented with the propagation and growth of many native plants, including grasses, wildflowers, and rare species. As a botanist, she's assisted on research projects for the Nature Conservancy, Florida Fish and Wildlife, and others. She has also helped federal, state, and local authorities find and evaluate rare plant communities. Nancy is also the co-author of the book, Native Plants for Florida Gardens, which features 100 native wildflowers, shrubs, vines, and trees for Florida yards. So Nancy, we're gonna turn things over to you and we'll let you take it from here. Oops. Hello, everyone. Okay, there we go. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk with you all this afternoon. I wish we could see each other to face and hopefully in the future we'll be able to do that. So 20 easy to grow wildflowers and they are in many, they can be seen in many special parts of the state, including Pinelands and flatwoods, sand hills, which are much drier, wet prairies, and even our pitcher plant bogs. Some seed creation sites, and you can bring them home and plant them in your own gardens. So we're going to start off with the milkweed and butterfly weed uh, group. And there are many species around the state, uh, not all readily available. They go all the way from very wet habitats uh, to the far right, it shows Curtis milkweed in the scrub. Three of them uh, we'll talk about as being available from uh, various growers. The butterfly weed, actually occurs as two subspecies in the state of Florida. The subspecies uh, Asclepias tuberosa wolfsii is uh, throughout the state 
often in drier habitats. But look at this uh, picture on the lower left-hand side. You can see the shape of the leaf, which is a little bit rounded or blunt at the end, and sometimes hastate at the base. The other is Asclepias tuberosa subspecies, tuberosa. And it's obvious that this is a longer, more pointed leaf. Uh, it can be found in a uh, little moisture habitat, somewhat wooded, a little bit shady at times. The second milkweed uh, are actually uh, found in much wetter habitat. Sometimes it's called swamp milkweed here, pink milkweed, Asclepias incarnata. And uh, it has a wide range in the US. It comes down into Florida. It's uh, quite common in the north end, but it does occur all the way through the south, even to Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary. The advantage of this species is it's large. It has lots of munchies for um, both the monarch and the queen butterfly for which it's a host. Will get uh, three to five or six feet tall when it's in bloom. And the color can range from fairly white to a much darker pink than is shown here. Here you see it with the queen butterfly on it. And the white milkweed, Asclepias perennis, frequently found in shady areas. Uh, quite showy and uh, obvious in even uh, slightly forested habitats. And uh, it only gets about 12 to 18 inches or, or so tall. Next species, the Maryland golden aster. Uh, the aster family is one of our largest uh, flowering families. And it also has special benefits for pollen because each head is actually a group of flowers with petals uh, that, that uh, or, or what looks like petals are actually ray flowers and then the disc flowers. So any pollinator has quite a few flowers that it can uh, uh, take nectar from in a single stop. Maryland Golden Aster Chrysopsis mariana gets 12 to maybe 15 inch tall, a little bit rounded. It likes somewhat moist, but not too moist habitats in the wild. So it's an easy transition to a garden. There's a close up of the flower. There are other Chrysopsis species one that I've encountered that's a biannual is Chrysopsis uh, scabroscula. And when I encountered a field of these one time, I was amazed at the variety of pollinators that could be seen. The rosemaries or false rosemaries are in the mid family, which is another popular family for wildflowers and pollinators. Conradina canescens, this one shown in the picture, is uh, naturally occurring in the panhandle in very dry, scrubby habitats. It's used, easily used in the garden setting. The only caution is that you don't confuse it with uh, Conradina brevifolia, which used to be included in this particular uh, species name, but is found in Eastern Polk and Highlands County along the Lake Wales Ridge is highly endangered. And so the request is, if you live in those areas, don't plant canescence there because these plants do cross. Large flower false rosemary, uh, can be found along the East Coast, more towards the southern end of the state. The flowers are a bit larger. The plant is a little bit more upright. It too has that minty odor and it is fairly easy to grow. 
uh, Coreopsis, another member of the Aster family, but even more special, this is our state wildflower. And there are 13 species or more, depending on uh, who is classifying what is native and what might be even the subspecies. But this one is an annual Coreopsis leavenworthii. And as an annual, it recedes very readily. But during the year that it's growing, it produces many, many blooms. Another neat aspect is that it's endemic to Florida and to all of Florida. It does eat a little bit into northern Georgia, uh, but basically the entire population is within Florida. Favorite habitat is moist sand. So again, that makes it an easy uh, plant to use in the home landscape. We seeded a mix of flatwoods, grasses, and wildflowers at Nemours uh, Children's Hospital. The first year, of course, the Coreopsis put on a terrific show, but the other species that are more perennial were in there. And over time, they will take over, uh, but that first initial show can be quite awesome. This is a perennial species, Coreopsis lanceolata, uh, found in North Florida and ekes into parts of Central Florida, but it can be used uh, widely even down into the more central areas of Florida. As a perennial, it gets only 12, maybe 15 inches tall. And in the lower picture, you see somebody has made it as their lawn, brightening up the local neighborhood. Florida green eyes, Berlandiera subacaulis. It's a sandhill species, meaning it likes dry, well-drained soils. But a unique aspect is that its root becomes a very thickened, uh, almost tuber-like, and in time, very old ones, that can be up to 12 inches wide. So it can store a great deal of water and is very hardy when it comes to drought. The other unusual aspect about it is that in this case, only the ray flowers produce seed, not the disc flowers. And those seeds develop, you can see in this lower um, picture of, of the green eyes, they develop in the wax. So when, when the petals drop off uh, and you break off these wax, you can see the seed tucked in there. Twin flower, Discarista oblongifolia, called twin, because when it blooms, it usually blooms as a pair or twins. Um, it's also a larval plant for the buckeye uh, butterfly. And it is a really easy to use ground cover. Uh, it spreads rhizomatously, gets maybe six to eight inches tall and has a fairly long blooming period throughout the growing months of the year. Um, there is an, another species that grows in little wetter and even shadier locations. So if your soil isn't real dry, well-drained, you can use that. So a little bit of a switch in thinking. Um, our climate in Florida, which if you look at this map of the world is right there, is in the horse latitudes. It's not in the Mediterranean or California habitat, which has dry summers and wet winters. We're the opposite. We have wet summers and dry winters. So this changes a bit how we do things. Now, this information actually came from a Florida stream study. But if you look at the uh, graphs with red bars, 
Here you can see one from North Florida where the rain falls a bit more even throughout the year. But if you look at these Central Florida locations, you see this big bump during the uh, summer months and fairly low rainfall for much of the rest of the year. But that's not quite the whole story. Looking to the left or here, something else becomes apparent. If you look at the evaporation, and here they're studying lake evaporation, but that's true for soils, et cetera, too. You see that the evaporation exceeds the rainfall in this time period, March, April, May. So this is the most stressful time of the year. And keep that in mind when you're planting. If you are planting with irrigation, that is not such a big problem. Uh, but without irrigation, uh, it would be, become a limiting factor. Also in your wildflower gardens, during that period of the year, you might wanna pay special attention to see if anything is truly stressed. Okay, back to plants. Uh, the two verses, the Tampa verse, Glandia tempensis, uh, and the other one, are both endangered species and endemic to Florida. Uh, this one grows a little taller, um, 12 inches plus, and uh, it does have lavender flowers, so sometimes we like to see other colors in the garden as well as attracting other types of pollinators. This is beech verbena, verbena maritima, grows much shorter. Uh, the Tampa verbena tends to grow a little bit on both coastal counties, east and west, and the beech verbena is more strictly naturally occurring on the east coast of our state. It's not truly a, a beech plant, uh, but it does tend to stay both of them in these coastal counties. And they like, of course, dry, well-drained soils. The sunflowers are a big family with lots of plants to choose from. The dune sunflower, Helianthus debilis, is very versatile. Uh, free ranging, sometimes too free, and you have to clip what wants to grow over the edge uh, or let it ramble a bit. And in some cases, it may not be really long lived, but it will recede. The one caution here is there are three subspecies uh, one that occurs on the East Coast, one that occurs on a west, couple of Western. Uh, counties, and the third one has a little more scattered um, range in Panhandle and some other counties. So the only is if you very near the, be sure you get the right subs. Lakeside sunflower, Helianthus carnosus, uh, grows in moist soil. I, and it is a very endangered plant naturally occurring in the state of Florida. However, it's very easy to grow both from potted plants and to germinate from seed, which is really unusual. And here you can see it makes a very nice dense rosette of leaves and the flowers shoot up through most of the growing season with very few leaves on the stem. So you know, it makes a beautiful cut flower as well. Rayless sunflower. And flower is the name that we've given it in our business only because men really seem to be drawn to this. Uh, it, it just, I guess, has a manly characteristic with that very dark color. Here in the center, you can see the blooms as they uh, progress. They start on the outer edge and, and as uh, they take turns blooming until they get to the center. The um, 
basil leaves are almost round, very thick and rough, so it's easy to identify them. Helianthus radula likes moist soils, and it's also very easy to put together with other uh, grasses and wildflowers, like you see in this picture. Uh, it really stands out against the chalky blue stem. The other thing I find fascinating is that you would think with such a relatively inconspicuous flower, it wouldn't draw many uh, critters, but it does. Many, many pollinators, and we even see uh, Katie did uh, visiting it. So moving on to the St. John's wort group. Uh, per, there are many, many species in this genus from uh, occupying very, very dry uh, to partially flooded uh, or seasonally flooded species. This one, Hypericum tenuifolium, likes moist, sandy areas. And it's very low growing, very dense. It's actually woody at the base. So it doesn't strictly fit the wildflower definition. Um, it also has a very unusual characteristic. On the top picture, that one plant can stretch three to five feet across if there's no competition. And yet when there is competition from adjacent plants, the spread isn't nearly as wide. So that's something you can take into consideration when you're spacing plants in the garden. Blazing stars are a wide group of plants, fall blooming, and yet um, they always look like they're full of life when they're blooming, especially because the big butterflies tend to it. The species range all the way again from very dry, Leatrice chapmanii, it blooms even a bit earlier in August. Leatrice elegans on the right-hand side uh, likes well-drained sandy soils. It occurs in north and just the northern part of central Florida. It has a very lacier, fluffier look to it. Graceful blazing star, Leatrice gracilis. And another one, uh, Leatrice livagata can take well-drained to moist soils. And so they're two of the very most versatile species. And Leatrice spicata, the wettest of our many blazing stars. It has a very wide range up through the Midwest. It is also grown commercially by four floral bouquets. So if you do get a bouquet with blazing star, it's probably this species. Even though in Florida, it grows in very wet, uh, the wetter end of our flatwoods, uh, it can be planted on much drier sites. And here it's backing up or fronting actually, um, mooly grass. Bee balm, Monarda punctata, a most versatile plant as far as critters are concerned. I remember driving along the Panhandle coast where Monarda was in bloom and it was almost orange with all the Gulf fritillary butterflies hanging on it. Uh, Monarda has actually uh, a ring of flowers that below it are a ring of bracts. And these bracts can be from this uh, lilac colored here to much pinker and almost creamy. So it, it just varies by whatever genetics it has acquired. Here's one that's a little bit more pink. It is truly one of our best pollinators. And as a reminder, we have 316 native bees in Florida in addition to our uh, European honeybee. And because of that, um, bee, 
balm is often chosen when research on pollinators needs to be done. Silver leaved aster, Pityopsis graminifolia. Uh, it is a plant that occurs in many forms throughout Florida, from well drained to moist soil. And its bloom period usually starts later in November and even into December a little. So it is a plant that is period in the garden. It is a, a little bit tricky to separate the different subspecies of uh, silver-leaved aster, and now there are taxonomists who are actually putting them in, in different uh, species uh, names. So the one on the right, Pityopsis graminifolia variety, Iquifolia, you can see the, the leaves stick out from the flowering stem, uh, make it look much fuller. And it is not rhizomatous. The picture below for variety Tracei is rhizomatous and will make a very fine ground cover. In fact, when it's not pushing up bloom stalks, it almost looks like a grass, except that it has that silvery sheen to it. This is a picture showing it in a seeded uh, setting on the left and a planted setting on the right. Black-eyed Susan, one of our most usable plants. Rudbeckia herca. Um, we actually have a variety called Floridana that is perennial and occurs in Central and South Florida. And um, there are other varieties that occur in North and Central Florida too. So it can be confusing, especially black eyes is so readily available on the general market. One way you can tell if you have variety of Floridana is it actually branches from the base of the plant rather than higher up. You can see on the upper picture the hairs on the stem. Uh, you can identify the plant in the garden by that rough texture caused by the hairs on the leaves. The neat thing about Rudbeckia is that it can bloom all year long. <laughs> this is actually soft hair um, Rudbeckia or coneflower. And here's a upside down squirrel munching on the blooms. So a little change of thought again. Uh, what are all of our wildflowers and grasses worth? A study was done on the ecosystem services in our roadside vegetation. This was general, not even talking about wildflowers. And it was determined that they're worth $0.5 billion. So one thing is that this made our road people in the state of Florida value the roadsides just a bit more. What can they do? Sequester carbon, prevent runoff, support crop pollinators and other insects in rural areas, contribute to air quality, uh, resist invasive species intrusion, and for aesthetics. And the uh, results also, the, the person who wrote the results also said that if our roadsides were actually covered with wildflowers and native grasses, that value could be doubled or more. So back to our 20 easy, wild petunia. I really resent the name. I tend to call it Ruelia. This one is Ruelia caroliniensis. They are actually in different families too. Um, Ruelia caroliniensis is kind of a miracle plant. It can grow in sun, fairly deep shade, 
very dry, well-drained soils, very wet soils that are mucky. It can have inner nodes that are quite long. It can have inner nodes that are very short, making it a much shorter plant. So the height of the plant can be 18 inches, 12 inches, maybe even six. Back to the mint family, scarlet sage, salvia coccinia. Uh, it's, it's nice to have a red flower included here. It is perennial and it reseeds easily. It has an interesting history. Scarlet sage actually uh, has a range that extends down into Northern South America and comes up through Central America, Mexico, Texas, spreads east to here. Where I have seen it in Florida, naturally, I somehow suspect that perhaps the uh, early Native Americans uh, helped to spread this species. That's just a thought unproven. Uh, it's, it's one of those plants that if it's bought on the general market, uh, you may get different colors, et cetera. I would suggest you get it from a local grower that has locally sourced it, but that's my preference. Another salvia, salvia lirata, lir leaf sage, is found throughout Florida. It has these beautiful purplish leaves at the base, the base of the rosette. A plus is it blooms very early, late winter, early spring. It reseeds easily too. It likes moist, fairly average soil. Uh, easy again for the garden. One of the things that I think is rather interesting is if you're driving on an east-west road where salvia lorada occurs and there are tall trees on both sides of the road, the south side of the road that has the shadow from the tall trees, actually the salvia lorada grows much more vigorously than on the north side of the road where it gets more sunshine. So it is fairly shade loving in Florida. So planting uh, techniques are pretty much the same for a native wildflower as it is for any other plant you can buy in the market. But there are a few things to learn. The plant can be absolutely dormant like blazing star that dies back down to the ground in the winter uh, in this upper picture. Uh, but you can plant it and as is from the container. Be careful again. Remember, spring is the highest stress time of the year. Normally, you do not need to do anything with the soil. But this plant should, for some reason, need fertilizer. Use a slow release and put it at the bottom of the hole. That way you're not feeding weeds that inevitably want to pop up on your site. Dig an oversized hole as usual and ham tuck. Also, wildflowers can be much more delicate than uh, other horticultural plants. And so tip it out of the container rather than pulling it. There are ways you can establish plants without an irrigation system. Uh, we always recommend watering the plants in well when they're planted, uh, make sure you're getting rid of any air pockets and it gets off to a good start. At Archibald Biological Station, we laid above ground PVC so that the plants could be watered initially until they were established. And after that, the uh, pipe was removed and used on another site. When you apply mulch, be careful not to cover the rosettes. And uh, you can apply it fairly thick at first and then let it thin out if you want reseeding to occur. So a short lesson on weeds, I can't give a talk without mentioning this. 
Weeds are the red cross of the plant world. They deal with ecological emergencies. I'm gonna read the whole thing. A weed is a species that depends on unnatural or severe disturbances to become established. By taking advantage of open space, germinating quickly, often one rain event, maturing quickly and producing seed in a short period of time, which falls back into the seed bank, that's the soil, to await the next disturbance. So if we're hand pulling, what can we do to pull out a weed and not have 10 or 20 take its place? Because when you pull out the weed, you're opening up the soil and that brings more seed to the surface or exposed to light, air, and space. And that's all it needs to take off. One suggestion that I have is when you are weeding, take a bucket of mulch with you. When you pull a weed, pat down a, a wad of mulch on that open, disturbed soil so you don't get more weeds. There are some plants you can use uh, like you would a weed. And my typical example is the Coreopsis leavenworthii. I showed you this picture earlier. But as I said, the uh, plants don't continue to bloom so profusely. However, the seed that is produced sinks back into the seed bank. Other plants show their muscle. But if there is a disturbance, like you see in the top picture where they put in a new drain, that seed bank will produce more Coreopsis, which to me is much more beautiful than many of our other weeds like ragweed. Learn to identify the seedlings. One hint that I have is you can go, besides growing some out yourself and observing, is to go to the Florida Wildflower Seed Co-op. And on that website, they have pictures of many seedlings. And allow plants to reseed. Only a couple of blazing stars were planted in this spot. And the next year, there were quite a few more. Deadheading or cutting back long blooming flowers can really be a, an advantage uh, to get more flower growth. At some point, you want to let plants rest, and possibly even the seeds would be uh, very appealing to various critters, even birds. OK, back to the 20. Skullcap, Scutellaria integrifolia, sometimes called helmet skullcap. It grows 12 to 18 inches or so. It can die back to the ground, but it does have these beautifully colored flowers, uh, different times of day, and uh, picture takers can give you a really different view of the color of this plant, but it is quite blue. Average soils, average moisture, 12 to 18 inches. The, the sennas are woody and can get five, six, seven feet tall. So strictly speaking, we, we wouldn't include them in wildflowers. Uh, however, they do offer a lot to caterpillars, especially. This is privet senna, and you can tell by the more pointed leaf blade. Chapman senna. Santa Mexicana variety Chapmanii. The, the leaves are a little more blunt tipped, not quite so long. And here are sulfur butterflies at uh, much on the Senna's. So that's why it's often included in gardens. Starry Silphium, Silphium Astericus. It is, I think, becoming one of my most favorite wildflowers because it does its job so beautifully. It can bloom all year long. In fact, 
this was taken at by them. These plants have been blooming year round for 10 years. They like well drained, moist soils. It is a rather robust plant. You can get up to three feet or more tall, but it's hard to replace it for a sheer amount of bloom and cheeriness. Solidagos are, or goldenrods are, again, a very large family. There are many to choose from. Here are the the seaside goldenrod. It has very long basal leaves and is large, four to six feet tall. It can even start blooming in the summer or even spring in South Florida. Lakes moist to wet soils. Pine barren goldenrod probably comes with a caution since it's a pioneering species, you often see it in ditches along roadsides in the fall. Uh, so it spreads fairly easily, rhizomously and profusely. So that may be what you want in your yard. This slender goldenrod or long goldenrod, Solidago strip is much better behaved. Uh, it's elegant. It grows in our pine lands, our flatwoods, together with uh, fall blooming white asters and the beautiful blazing stars. So it can put forth a really magnificent show. It too likes moist soils. And Chapman's goldenrod is for the dry soils of our sand hills and scrubs, blooms early, uh, end of summer. And a single plant can be fairly bushy. You don't usually see it in natural areas where it's competing with other plants. So Chapman's Goldenrod, Solidago odora, variety Chapmanii. And asters. Uh, asters are the end of the season plant almost anywhere in the US. Not also true for Florida, extends our bloom period, availability again for pollinators into November, December. This one, the Elliott's aster, grows upright, um, three, four feet tall, and has lots of fluffy bloom at the top, very, very showy. It will spread also, and so that needs to be taken into consideration. Is it a place where you can contain it, or are you willing to keep it in check? One that doesn't need so much control is a Carolina aster, some Phyotrichum carolinianum. Yes, they all used to be called asters, but now we have to deal with this word, Symphyotrichum. Carolinianum. Uh, the Carolina aster is almost a little viney, but when planted by itself, it just climbs on itself. If you are in a area where bald cypress is growing, often you will see this plant um, growing on the uh, hummock, a, the little raised area around the cypress trees or, or other plants. It also has a very sweet odor. You can tell it from far away. So enjoy your wildflowers. Plant them, use them, smell them, experiment with them, just have fun with them. Or take a walk uh, in an urban area where they're growing or in parks like Bach Tower Gardens for this wet prairie. Uh, is planted, or get out into our beautiful natural areas, take your family, enjoy the fall, especially when they're at their peak. So if you want to know more about these particular 20 wildflowers, this uh, document, a PDF, is actually available on the Florida Wildflower Foundation website look under learn and learn about wildflowers. 
or if you want to learn about even more than these 20, uh, you can get the book, Native Plants for Florida Gardens, which Stacy Matrasso and I uh, wrote. It's available through the Florida Wildflower Foundation and other bookstores. So I must end with a big thank you to the many photographers who contributed to this program and giving their, their beautiful pictures to the Florida Wildflower Foundation and the Florida Association of Native Nurseries. I urge you, if you have particularly beautiful pictures, especially in landscape settings, please share with one of these organizations. And if possible, uh, the next chance you get, purchase the state wildflower plate for the Florida Wildflower Foundation and or become members. Uh, we, we hope to see you again and uh, that you will join us in, in future informationals. Thank you. All right, thank you, Nancy. Um, this is Lisa. And uh, we're going to be taking some questions now. We have a few queued up. Um, one of them is a, a really good question about Coreopsis. And um, do different species of Coreopsis hybridize? I can't think of any that do. They're, they're pretty species specific. Um, that's true of most of the wildflowers I've talked about, but not all. Not all. I know several years ago we did um, a, a um, gene flow study with um, Coreopsis tinctoria and um, I think it was Coreopsis leavenworthii and mm -hmm. uh, or, or, or lanceolata and they, they did not hybridize in that study even though they were planted oh. really close together. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something. So um, another question about planting uh, wildflowers. What do you mean by hand tuck? Oh, okay. <clears throat> you dig the hole larger than the pot. You get the pot set at the right elevation, and then you have to fill in that space around the pot. Instead of just piling the dirt in, tuck it with your fingers so that you get rid of all the air pockets. Okay, and then uh, you would want to water that in really well? Yes, and what we do is we actually fill up like halfway to the top uh, and then water it and then fill in the rest of the way. Great. Okay. Um, do you have any recommendations for native grasses that are great to go with some of these um, 20 easy wildflowers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I have a whole program on grasses, rushes and sedges. Uh, and we do have many beautiful grasses. Some would include wire grass, which is very dominant component in our upland systems and very sturdy. Um, there's lopsided Indian grass. There are many beautiful andropogons that are not weedy or pioneering. Uh, are very much a part of our ecosystem and they give so long through the more dormant times of the year with their seed heads. That's a few, there's more. Okay. Um, do you have any recommendations for help books, uh, websites, et cetera, for the design and planning of native landscapes? Hmm. Maybe you all can help me out here. Um, there's a lot of information online, and I know the Florida Wildflower Foundation has quite a few articles too. There are some older books that um, I have on my bookshelf. I, I, I don't really want to take the time to pull them all out now, uh, but I can't think of any real recent ones that have been done. All righty. Um, Barbara would like to know, she's in Venice in, in Sarasota County and would um, like a milkweed recommendation for her location. 
any of the three I mentioned would work well, depending on the soil, of course, uh, keeping in mind that both the um, pink and white milkweeds um, like a moister soil than the butterfly weed. Okay. Um, Irene would like to know what to plant under oaks. Hmm. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> in, in a, if you look at oak hammocks in the wild, the drier oak hammocks may have uh, a, a um, um, beautyberry bush or saw palmetto occasional, not solid, uh, often a cover of witchgrass, Dicanthillium portersensi. As the, if the oaks are a little wetter, they might have a little bit more cover, but oaks are so, offer so much shade and, and draw so much water and nutrients that it's hard for other plants to actually um, compete with that. And so keeping it somewhat open, I think is ideal. It's natural. This is the kind of place the early uh, pioneers used to build their houses. It was also naturally more fire resistant. Okay. Uh, Trisha would like to know how to get river sage to fill in. Um, it's leggy in dry shade and spreading well, but not becoming the bushy ground cover I'd hoped for. River, <clears throat> river sage. Are we talking about salvia micella? Yes. Is yes. that right? Okay. Oh. It's, it's sparse. It might need more moisture than where she's got it. Mm -hmm. um, if, if the, the uh, height and thickness of river sage really do depend on a little bit of light, uh, adequate moisture. You vary any of those and you get different results. Alrighty. Uh, oh, uh, I was, I just thought to going back to the question about what can I put under my oak? Um, that's one, if, if it's not too shady the river sage, and also the Ruelia that I mentioned earlier. All right. Um, so the best, it, is it best to plant wildflowers in early fall seeds or transplants? Question mark. You can plant any time of the year from containers. Um, if you do not have irrigation, then it's better to work with the seasons. And uh, if you are planting without any irrigation and you're, you're just hoping for the best, then we recommend planting the last half of July and the month of August when the rains are most consistent and the plants have a chance to get established before you hit the spring drought. All right. Um... And um, let's see, can you, uh, do you have a favorite one or two ground covers uh, of wildflowers for shady areas with um, spreading and good coverage shady and moist? I think that would be the salvia micella. I forgot what you call it. River sage, is that right? Um, would, would be an ideal one. Um, Again, you can use Ruelia. Um, there is the other twin flower uh, that grows in wetter, moister locations that can be used. I don't have the species on the tip of my tongue right now, uh, but it's not Discrista oblongifolia. It's the other one and is grown by some of our native growers. Mm -hmm. Um, can you explain how to differentiate the uh, rhizom rhizomotus rudbeckia? Um, well, there's 
Rudecchia, Herta, not, none of those are rhizomatous. Well, actually, most of the uh, Rudbeckias, except for Herta, the black-eyed Susan, are North Florida panhandle species. And I know one of them, like the, the soft hair one that I showed the squirrel, Munch uh, is a biennial, and I think maybe slightly rhizomatous. But other than that, I'm not real familiar with any of those, so I hesitate to give an answer. Uh, uh, Herta is definitely not rhizomatous. Right. Um, Lee says she meant the uh, perennial Rebecca getting confused. <laughs> so um, I'm not sure what Claudia um, is this. There, she's posted a um, Florida friendly star uh, landscape, I guess, um, um, link and is asking, is that a good place to start? If you're, if you're looking for more information on wildflowers, is that the question? I, I believe so. Okay. I would definitely go to the Florida Wildflower Foundation um, for information, the Florida Association of Native Nurseries for sources. And if you have a local native nursery, it is uh, a good place to ask about details of plants because those who grow these plants know a great deal, especially for their area. So I, I think they're a very fine source. Uh, okay, and Tiffany wants to know, uh, we moved into our home two years ago in Hudson. Uh, there were very few pine, uh, pine woods milkweeds starting to grow or plants growing and um, they've since disappeared. Are they native and will they come back? Pine woods milkweed? Uh -huh. I, I, I don't know the common name. Um, do you by chance? No, I'm not sure which one that would be. Okay. Well, there are there are quite a few um, native milkweeds. They're beautiful. Uh, in my experience, they don't always come up the same plants year after year. They might have an off year. They they are generally um, herbaceous and they, they will die back to the ground. Uh, so if you don't see it one year, that doesn't mean that it's gone. Uh, the other factor is usually you have to have enough of a population species uh, or plants to keep a population going. So sometimes that can be a factor, but don't rule it out yet. Um, she may she may be talking about um, humistrata. So sleepiest. Yes, humus. yeah, that one too. What what a beautiful plant that is. Yes. Yeah. Um, and it may, may not appear every year. And you may have a really bumper year. There is that variation. Great. Um, I don't see any more questions. We've got one more minute. So if you're sitting on a question mm -hmm. you'd like an answer, now's your chance. <laughs> um, Nancy's provided her email address and visit at thenatives.net. Um, so you can um, email her questions if you'd like, or give her a call. Um, she's got her on the last slide we're looking at. Um, Nancy, I think we're going to close it. And thank All you right. so much for joining us. And um, again, if you didn't get your question answered, you can either email us at info at flawildflowers.org or um, email Nancy directly at nbisset at thenatives.net. I hope you'll join us um, for our, our webinar in September, which will be no lawns. Mm -hmm. So that'll be a good one. Um, they'll, they'll be, we'll be posting information on that one soon. Um, so watch our um, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter feeds. All right. Thank you, Nancy. We appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you all for listening. Email rather than call, please. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Nancy. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you.